You're listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Captivate and on Patreon. You can get bonus content of our show on either of those platforms or on Apple Podcasts with a private subscription to the Amazal Ministries Podcast Network. Hey guys, Joshua here. Unfortunately, today's episode was only partially recorded. Um, At the 50 minute mark, we top Dr. Thomas Orr got cut off. Um, the episode actually went on for about 20 minutes longer, but I still feel like we had a lot of really valuable conversation here. So I went ahead and kept what we did have. Um, at the end, I'm just going to kind of summarize what we talked about after that and let you know what's coming up next for the show. Thank you guys so much for listening and for your understanding in this um, partial episode, a long partial episode, but a partial episode. First John chapter three, verses 18 through 22 in the New American Standard Bible. Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of truth and will set our hearts at ease before him that if our heart condemns us, that God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Um, In this section of scripture, the reader's told to trust in God because we know he knows all things. Um, We're told to trust in the ways of love by acting them out rather than just speaking in love. Um, Dr. Thomas Ord, how do you believe the author meant for us here to show our love and to trust God by what he's saying here? It sounds to me like it's a fairly general kind of statement, and that's helpful because we all live in different circumstances, have different interests have various relationships. And so if the author was trying to very to pinpoint the precise ways in which we might know and love, then the author would miss the vast majority of the knowing and loving that we do. So I think it's appropriate to give a general statement and then ask the readers, us in this case, to apply them. And how would you apply that in this time? How would I apply the knowledge or the love or what do you mean? Yeah, the love. How would we apply love in our time now? Well, I was loving, uh, doing my best to love in the last 10 minutes as I drove quickly across town to be a part of this interview. Because I consider the time you and I spend together talking about big ideas, an act of love, uh, an act of love for one another, for the folks who are going to listen or watch this because my intention in life is to try to make the world a better place, to be a participant in the kingdom of God, to in some way add value to the world. And so I think moment by moment, whatever our circumstances, we're called to love. Those circumstances are very white. Mm, man. Yeah, I most do like a hallelujah Pentecostal kind of moment. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I agree with all that. Yeah, that's good stuff. That is good stuff. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Whole Church Podcast. This could be your favorite Church Unity Podcast. Maybe not. It's okay. If it's not, it's fine. I am not joined by your favorite co-host, so you just have me. But to make up for it, which we've done many a time, we brought on another Tom. (laughs) Uh, Possibly your favorite Tom, Dr. Thomas Ord. He is the author of a lot of different books. Um, We've talked before about The Death of Omnipotence, uh, I think was one of the books we discussed on here. Your why the Nazarene church should be fully LGBTQ plus confirming. Um, and we have him back today to talk about omniscience. Is God all knowing? Uh, you know, we've had our disagreements, me, you and Christian about omnipotence and whether God's all powerful. So I don't know if we'll agree or disagree or what, but soon we'll find out. <laughs> we discuss our different <laughs> beliefs on what God can or cannot know. Um, for now, we're going to go ahead and let you guys know that you can support the show. You can go to Amazon Ministries podcast. Uh, the AMP Network website, the link's down below. If you want to see other shows like this, or if you want to subscribe to the network, support all of our shows, um, you know, we, we support you supporting us, basically. Yeah, and rate and review our show on Podchaser or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever you are listening on also works. And with that, I get to jump into mm, one of my favorite spiritual practices, um, a, a foolproof way to have unity which is silliness. And I'm going to start with a silly question. And um, I guess this one I feel like is less silly 
and more thought provoking. I don't know what I was doing when I when I came up with this <laughs> one, but we'll see. We'll see what you think. All right. Um, I'll answer first. Give you time to think about it. If you could possess the power to explore all of space or choose the ability to breathe underwater and explore all that is in the ocean in our own planet, which would you choose? Um, for me, it's easy. It's the ocean. Um, part of this is from a, a biases that I, I just am not convinced there's a ton of life outside of our own solar system that there might be. I'm probably wrong and that's fine. What I do know is there is an absurd amount of life here on our own planet and I've always loved the sea. So I'm just deeply fascinated by what's down there. So that's what I go with. The biggest problem being I'd also have to have the power to see in the dark. But, you know, if I'm giving, you know, unlimited breathing underwater power, I feel like I could also get the ability to see in the dark. <laughs> Should go hand in hand. Um, Dr. Ward, where are you going? All of space or all of the sea? You know, this one's easy for me, too, but it's the opposite. I would rather go to all of space. <laughs> Now, um, okay. you know, I I happen to think there probably is life outside of uh, our contact at the moment. But let's just assume for a second there isn't life beyond uh, beyond this planet. I still think, you know, the what is it? 400 trillion other universes they are estimated. That just seems like yeah. even if there's not any life in any of them, the the capacity for potential beauty is just so Ooh, immense um, and you know I can't imagine being able to explore it all I'd have to live an awful long time of course the ocean is big too but uh, awesome. I think there's probably more to explore in the multiple universes than even in the ocean so yeah. I'll go the other one yeah. although to see all of either we would probably need multiple lifetimes <laughs> good point good. yeah yes I um also I just want to say I don't think that there isn't life outside of our solar system. I, I'm just not convinced there's a ton of life outside of our solar system. Oh, okay. System. Yeah. I, don't, yeah. I think the potential is limited. But again, I'm probably wrong. So we're going to move on from this. We'll do more sci fi talk some other time. <laughs> today we're going to jump in. And um, before we jump to today's topic, we've had you on our show a few other times this year. Um, we've just, and I mentioned earlier, we disagreed over some of the issues of omnipotence of God, um, LGBTQ things. Although I think, uh, you and I were closer on those issues than Christian. I wish he could have been there. We love you, Christian. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, we even kind of disagreed some on like what it looks like in practice, whether church unity really is something we should aspire for, all those kind of things. And um, so before getting into today's topic, I was just kind of hoping maybe you could remind our followers what your views are and where you stand concerning what we've talked about before, the LGBTQ issues and um, God's omnipotence. Sure. I'm an open and relational theologian, and that's going to be important for our discussion today on omniscience. But open and relational theologians in general reject the idea that God controls everything. I happen to also think that God simply can't control anything at any time. So there are some open theists, open and relational people who will say God could and maybe sometimes controls here and there. And God has that kind of omnipotence, but I don't think it makes sense to think that God could ever control anyone from quarks to quasars. In terms of the queer issue, I'm a fully affirming person. That means that I think that healthy queer relationships, sexual relationships are appropriate and should be fully affirmed by the church. It doesn't mean that I think any sexual expression whatsoever is healthy. That's not true of heterosexuals. It's not true of queer people. But I'm fully affirming of the healthy ways in which queer people can act and be and live on the earth. Yeah, and I will um, I'll put links in the notes below if people want to hear more about those two topics. Um, especially, yeah, I say especially. All of them, I know, are deeply interesting to people and things that people talk a lot about. Um, and, and I just want to throw out there that um, over the many conversations I've been able to have with Dr. Ord, it's always been a great pleasure to see. He doesn't just throw the Bible out. He's not just like, oh, I like this stuff better. This just makes me feel better. No, this is like <laughs> deeply thought out stuff. He does care about the Bible. Yes. And, uh, you guys need to go listen, read some of his other books, listen to our other episodes and um, hear more about that. But hmm. Today, I don't want to spend too much time on that stuff and backtracking. I want to move forward in our conversation. So we're going to jump straight to the point because I told you earlier, I don't actually know the answer to 
this. What do you believe about God's ability to know everything? Well, I'm it may surprise you. Yeah, for those it may know. surprise you to hear that I do think God is omniscient. God knows everything that's knowable. However, the content of God's knowledge that I think God has differs from what most people think. I think God knows everything that's ever happened in the past, everything that's happening in the present as soon as it happens, and everything that's possible in the future. But God doesn't, in fact, can't know with absolute certainty what's going to happen in the future because there's no future yet to be known. It's not uh, a fact yet. It's just a realm of possibilities. That's part of what it means to be an open and relational thinker. Man, that's um oddly close to what I believe. <laughs> this oh, is going to be this is going to be way different than some of our other episodes. <laughs> yeah, I um so so for me it kind of comes down to a philosophy of time, if that yeah. makes sense. Um and I think if my philosophy of time is wrong, then this gets a lot trickier, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because uh f- for me, I just don't think the future exists. So you can't know the future if it doesn't exist. Like that's just paradoxical. Right. Um and I yeah, and to me, I just I really don't believe in time as a as a thing, if that makes sense. Like right. I feel like I everything mean, has temporal parts, but there isn't just this dimension or thing that is time that exists separate from us. I'm with you on that, that too. Yeah, yeah. I Man, this is weird. <laughs> in the philosophical language, it's it, people say time is not a substance. That yeah. means that I don't think God created time because time isn't something to create. Now, I think God created creatures and creatures are timeful, but that's different from saying God created a substance called time. And that's also different from what most in the Christian and uh, Islam traditions have said. Yeah. Yeah, man. This is this is fun. I like that. <laughs> I like being in agreement. This is nice. Yeah. 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 I, um, yeah. I think since everything has temporal parts, if God were to have made all things, which is, you know, what I believe, then necessarily he made their temporal parts. But that doesn't mean he knows what the future will be because there is no such thing as future. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. Now, and it's fun. I have I have fun on some of my other I do a podcast dummy for theology and I kind of like contemplate other people's beliefs and just kind of throw out there that. I don't think I'm all knowing. I fully admit I could be wrong about any number of things. <laughs> Let's hope. Yeah. 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 So I, I wonder about like if time was linear, like the way a lot of people think of, like how would God relate then? Would God have his own timeline? Because he seems to interact with this timeline. Or like, you know, if time was linear in the way that sci-fi movies betray, how would it work? You know, or um, there's what's it called? The box theory of time, I think is what it's Clock called. Universe. Yeah, yeah, where everything's just kind of exist. Um, In Doctor Who language, you might say a big ball of wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. So it's not, (laughs) you know, linear, but it's all there. So God could just exist outside of the box. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think in any number of those other ones, you have to have where God created time. But if you don't believe in time like that, you don't need that. Yeah, I totally agree. In the in the philosophical discussion. There's all kinds of, you know, ways you can go with this. But the the two general ways are to say God is either eternal in the sense of timeless or God is everlasting in the t- in the in the sense of being uh, sequentially uh, oriented in time. And I'm in that last one. It sounds like you are as well. Now, there is a, another there are a couple of ways to think about God moving through time. And not being timeless, but being time full, which I like to say. One mm-hmm. of them, and the one I'm attractive to, attracted to, says that God can't know the future because future isn't there yet, and God, you know, God knows everything knowable. But there's a, a position called Molinism, named after a Jesuit from I think the 15th or 16th century, and he had this proposal. He said um, maybe God once existed all alone. And then could somehow foresee all the possible universes to create whatsoever. So let's say there's a billion possible universes. Um, God could foresee all of them and not just foresee them, but see the details of how every last thing would play out in whatever universe God was looking at. 
And then God chose the best of all, that billion universes, knowing, again, how everything's going to play out in that universe. People who have that particular view will say, well, God does experience time, but God knows with absolute certainty what's going to happen because God chose to create this universe with all of these you know, things that are going to lay out. Mm-hmm. Now, I think there's tons and tons of problems with that, but some of the smartest Christian theolo- or philosophers today, like um, mm-hmm. Al Plantinga or uh, Bill Craig or people like that, uh, they hold to that particular view. Yeah. And what's interesting though, that you, I don't know if you meant to bring up, but brought up for me that I do think there should be a distinction made between when I say, I don't think time is real. And then the experience of time, we clearly do experience time. Sure. But there's a lot of things I experience that doesn't mean that it exists on its own. You know, I experienced yes. lots of sense and um, this is interesting factoid. Um, I had my octal nerve damaged in brain surgery. So sometimes I smell stuff and I'm not smelling what everybody else smells at all. (laughs) Mm. That doesn't mean that experience isn't real. It just means that I'm picking up the wrong experience, you know? Mm. So I think that there is such a thing as an experience of time, but that doesn't serve as proof that there's this linear thing exist outside of ourselves called time. Yeah. Um, I like that a lot. I'm curious. Have you, have you watched Loki? (laughs) I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Like, I feel not, like that's not a very intelligent question to ask a scholar. But like, have you seen those? Uh, Disney show? That, though. <laughs> you're not the first to ask. Oh, so you haven't seen it? No. Uh, so without spoilers, uh, I, I want to get into some of it because it, it does relate to some of this time stuff where the the main character is Loki, surprisingly enough. <laughs> And he's having some weird experiences and stuff with time and it's like glitching and everything's like they have what's called a sacred timeline. And it very much feels like when people talk about predestination and God meant everything and this is the whole plan and how it's going to be. And they get into this distinction of is there a sovereign timeline or is there free will and all these other timelines can branch off of it? Yeah. Um, In the end, you have someone who actually holds all the different timelines together and kind of basically serves as a sacrifice that enables all of the different branches because free will on of itself ends in chaos. But if you get rid of all the branches, then there is no such thing as free will. There's just sovereign timeline. And I'm like, man, that really makes me think a lot about Dr. Ward stuff. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't help but imagine Jesus on the cross kind of serving as this, this point where God's holding all those timelines saying you have the freedom you have the possibility to take any of these routes now you know i'm kind of a soft universalist where i'm like i think god does that because he knows any number of my timelines are going to lead me back to him eventually (laughs) but that's where you get to weird stuff when you talk about time (laughs) yeah yeah it could be that there are multiple uh possible worlds or timelines to use your uh phrase that all end up with something like universal salvation. I doubt that's the case. I doubt it in part because it would seem to undermine the gravity or the responsibility of our free moral choices in the moment. And that's one of the reasons yeah. I'm not a um, hardcore universalist, because I think if if we're all mm-hmm. guaranteed to find full salvation, no matter what we do, it makes our choices insignificant. And Mm. I think insignificant choices uh, aren't full-throated free will choices. Yeah, which, yeah, I definitely get that point. Uh, For me, and again, I think it comes down to the omnipotence thing. (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) I just can't see a God who has the ability to bring us all back to himself. Not eventually, you know, maybe my choices will make it take longer or I'll have a more miserable path along the way. Or, you know, since I know, we both have weird views of hell. Maybe I'll experience hell along the yeah. way. <laughs> yep. But, you know, it, because I believe that God can save everyone, I necessarily have to believe that he's going to. But if I didn't have that omnipotent thing getting in my way, I, I feel like I'd probably be more in your your lane. There. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. If I believed in omnipotence, I would be a universalist because I think God is a loving God and would guarantee that no one spends eternity in hell or no one – uh, suffers unnecessarily. But of course, you know, the problem, there's lots of problems with your position. The biggest one is if this God has the kind of omnipotent power to guarantee everybody gets to the good place in the end, 
that God's doing a really poor job of stopping the evils here and now. And if that oh, yeah. God doesn't stop evils here and now, then why should we be so confident God will stop them there and then? For more of that. Because <laughs> I know we <laughs> both pointed out some of our weaknesses and stuff on omnipotence in the other episode. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just point it back to that episode and bring this back with omniscience. Good. Um, the Bible does, in a lot of different places, talk about God knowing all things, all that stuff. Do you think every time it's referring to him knowing everything that's knowable? I, I highly doubt that most of the biblical writers had a sophisticated view of God's relation to time in mind when they said those things. Now, I can take those and say, hey, that applies to my view. But someone who thinks that God <laughs> yeah. does know the future, they can take it and apply it to their view as well. I yeah. think what's more, um, more interesting and more supportive of my view are all the times in which God has a change of mind or God says, I'm going to do this. And then God does something else. Like the end of the Jonah story is a good example of this. Um, Jonah, God tells Jonah to tell the people of Nineveh that God is going to destroy them. And if God can't tell a lie, then that's going to happen. And if God knows the future, you think then, well, therefore it's already settled. But when Jonah gets to Nineveh, the king of Nineveh and the people say, you know, maybe if we put on sackcloth and ashes and change our ways, maybe God won't destroy us. And that's exactly what they did. And the story ends by saying God repented. In fact, more than 40 times in the scriptures, God repents. But if God knows with absolute certainty everything <laughs> that's ever going to happen in the future, like a lot of Christians think, then that repentance stuff doesn't really make literal sense. It must be some sort of bad biblical writing. Yeah, I, I think what will trip most people up with <laughs> this is with our stance, I guess, when it comes to omniscience. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of places in the Bible of like prophecy of God telling people what's going to come, all that kind of thing. But I think that still falls in line because sometimes you see the prophecy either doesn't come true or a lot of our prophecies are, if this, then this. God very right. seldomly has a prophecy that this is exactly what will happen next. You know, it's usually if you continue to sin, this is what will happen next. Yeah. Which you makes don't me have feel like it's a future. potential prophecy rather than a. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's like when I tell my kids, you know, um, if you don't study for this this test, you're not going to get a good grade in class. Well, I don't have to know the future with certainty to know that lack of study means likelihood of a bad grade. Um, so a lot of biblical passages can be explained in that way. But I think actually the majority of biblical passages aren't uh, th that talk about prophecy aren't about predictive prophecy. They're passages that say the prophet stands up and says, we are treating ourselves our, and others and the land wrongly. And if we don't change, you know, life is going to be bad for us in some way. Sin sucks. Um, now, there are some prophecies in which God says God will do something in the future. And that can fit with the model. You and I have no problem because God can make a decision, you know, now or plans, we say, to do something and then also have a change of mind. But I, I want to admit there are some passages, not as many people, as many as many passages as me, people think, mm -hmm. but there are a few that sound like predictive prophecies. The, my favorite example is when Jesus says to Peter, before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Man, that sounds mm -hmm. really specific. And somehow, you know, Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen in the future that involves not only Peter's decisions, but also roosters crowing. <laughs> um, yeah. And I have some folks who think like us, open relational people who have some attempts to solve that issue. My hunch is that that's a, an example of something that goes against our theory. Um, mm -hmm. But because I don't think the Bible is a systematic theology and everything fits together perfectly, <laughs> I don't lose yeah. sleep over that. Yeah, I um, this is where I get in trouble a little bit with some of my more conservative friends. But I, <laughs> yeah, I hold inerrancy very loosely. I I don't usually even use the word inerrancy because I'm like, yeah, what most people mean by that is not what I want to say that I believe. <laughs> yes. So I um, you know, I, I think that the Bible is a piece of literature, and that at that time, um. 
they didn't have history books. Like there wasn't a genre of here is exactly what happened. Let us tell you the story. There was plenty of genres that were telling you a story that was, you know, intentionally embellishing things or changing the order to make a different point. And it was more about the moral and stuff than it was a historical document. So it's easy for me to read that and just go, oh, yeah, that was just, you know, the author taking some creative liberty to kind of paint a picture of Jesus knowing he was going to be betrayed. Yeah, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Of course you would do that. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Some people read this as this is literally what happened and Jesus knew the future. And I'm like, oh, well, OK, that is interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think we ought to take that position seriously, although I think yeah, it's the wrong position. Definitely. But I think the bigger question that becomes, how do you decide which of these two views to take? The God knows the future view, or there's no future for God to know view. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the way you resolve that is to ask other questions about what you think God is like, what you think experiences like, whether or not we can trust our experience. Um, mm -hmm. As an open and relational person, I think a God is a God of love who gives freedom and is uncontrolling. So that's going to fit really nicely with the notion that God doesn't know the future yet because there's no future yet to know, rather than God knows it all in advance because that sounds like it's already settled and therefore free will yeah. doesn't fit in very well. No, that's um, I'm I'm gonna backtrack a little bit before okay. I get into that because we were talking about some of the biblical stuff, and you provided a I think a really good example of a biblical instance that goes against our view. Yeah. Do you have any? And we mentioned a few that kind of support us and what I think of like the prophecy in the Bible. Do you have anything as far as like a biblical instance that goes against the other side? Is there if we were only using the Bible? Is yeah. there good reason to take either view? I guess that's my question. So, yeah. Uh, well, here's here's one from Hezekiah. Hezekiah tells the prophet, "Go, go tell King Hezekiah that his life is going to end. In fact, it repeats it. You will surely die. It says it twice. And oh, wow. you know, if you've if you've seen that, if you know people talking that, that's kind of like." the way of saying this is really going to happen when it's repeated and doubly. And then Hezekiah yeah. says, well, what if I pray and ask for 10 more years of life? And he does that. And the mm -hmm. prophet comes back and says, yep, you're going to get 10 more years. So you've got an instance in which if it's really true that God told the prophet that the king is going to die, then and God knows the future with certainty and God can't lie, then God had a change of mind and a change of mind doesn't fit with the notion of the future being settled and God, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not, oh, yeah. sorry. Go I ahead. just thought of an example that I can butcher and see if you can fix. Okay. <laughs> uh, in, in the old Testament, there are a few different times where when Israel's in exile, they ask how long, and they basically get an answer. That's like 77s or 70 weeks, something like that. Um, you know what I'm referring to? I don't No, No. Okay. I know it's in Daniel. Okay. I want to say it's at the end of like Ezra or something too, but there's a few different places, you know, they're asking, you know, how long and a lot of the, I'm trying to think of the name of the literature for like it's Jewish literature that was in between the old and new Testament. You had yeah. a lot of um, leaders in the Jewish faith who were trying to predict what that meant. And cause it didn't line up exactly. And they either was like, Oh, you know, it was a close guest or, you know, it really meant, 77 or not, you know, 77s, yeah. or it really meant, you know, and they had all kinds of different by 70 weeks, it meant weeks of years. That's something a lot of my professors even told me in college. And that's how it lines up. If you mean years instead of weeks, then that's what it meant. Um, I think that's a really but, important point here, Joshua, what you're yeah. pointing to here. Everybody who thinks that the Bible has to support their view perfectly will come up with creative interpretations of biblical oh, yeah. passages that go against them. I know this is the tr true of people who think like I do, like this, you know, the cock crows twice sort of example. I know people come with really mm -hmm. creative, you know, things like, well, somehow Jesus knew Peter so well and knew the circumstances <laughs> or, yeah. you know, the cock crows twice was just an idiom of the day and it wasn't to be taken literally, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. And I'm not against that sort of thing. I'm just saying at the end of the day, I don't think the scriptures alone can solve this issue because the mm -hmm. people who have these views can easily interpret passages in support of it and figure out ways to explain away the ones that don't support them. Well, <laughs> well and uh, 
So the reason I brought mine up too, though, is uh, I read one commentary that actually suggests that's why Jesus says we forgive 70 times, seven times. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's Jesus was kind of making a little dig at that. And I'm like, I, I like that. <laughs> you know, we, we definitely all do that. You know, even if mine, you know, oh, it's literature, it's this. A, a lot of times it kind of feels like fanfic. You know, like yeah, we didn't yeah. quite like what the story said. So yep. we wrote in some stuff and kind of came up with our own little version of things until it fits just what we want it to fit. Oh, there's scripture that's fan fiction. It's oh, there's yeah. scripture in which the writers <laughs> change the story that they, they've got, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's very common. Yeah. So you were, you were getting to, before I backtracked us to some, <laughs> to see okay. what all the scripture said on both sides, um, you, you were kind of getting to what we want to believe about God. And I I think both of us would say, we don't, this is going to sound really weird. We don't want a God that's just what we want there to be out there. We would rather believe what is true than rather than just a God that happens to fit our preferences. Um, And it just seems when I look at reality that for, for me, God who is love would fit better, not just the scripture, but my experience, you know, I could do the whole, um, quadrilateral right <laughs> like my yeah, experience yeah. tradition you know that yeah. that god of love seems to fit reality a little bit better is where i would go and um I, I, I like that what you too. yeah i i would say it fits my experience it fits i think it better fits what the arts and sciences and history mm-hmm. has told us it fits the diversity of sacred text not only within the christian tradition but between religious traditions um i yeah. i, I I, I want to avoid two extremes. One extreme is the one you mentioned, and it says, well, I'm just making God up in whatever I, what way I want. I'm just winging it here, and I don't have any sort of guardrails or any sources mm-hmm. from which yeah. to choose. And that's not true. I, my, As you mentioned, I draw from scripture. I draw from tradition. I draw from reason, experience, etc. The yeah. other one that I want to avoid, and I hear it amongst uh, Christians sometimes, it says this, I don't trust myself at all. I just have the Bible, or I just have the tradition. Oh, and yeah. they Just preach they the pre- cross. Yeah. And they pretend like their own preferences and biases and perspectives aren't informing their theological interpretation and decision-making. And that's just wrong. I mean, it's just, it's obvious to everybody else (laughs) what they're doing. Um, (laughs) And so I want to avoid those two extremes, knowing that there's lots of room in between those two extremes. Yeah, no, I I definitely like that. I definitely like that. I mean, it's, it's interesting how many of the only the Bible people, when they tell their testimony, isn't they picked up a Bible read it and said, yep, that's right. <laughs> you know, yeah. usually it is an experience that brought them to the Bible. Right. Um, and, and I think that's part of what makes this conversation so difficult. And, and you know, I'll just open up with myself because I had, um, I had issues coming to where I am with time now for a long time. Mm-hmm. I also agreed, you know, God had his, I think I thought that God had his own timeline that was different mm-hmm. than our timeline was kind of my belief rather than he didn't experience time at all, which is what a lot of people believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was because of my experience and my experience Time is feels linear, right? <laughs> like, you know, days ago were days ago. Tomorrow's tomorrow. It feels right. linear. Exactly. Um, but then once I took the time to kind of examine science and you see that gravity can affect time and different things can affect how something experiences time makes me go. So my experience of time doesn't line up with the idea that time is something that exists outside of me. Right. Which challenged how I read the Bible completely. Did you have anything like that? Or have you always just been like... This is what time is. You know, I was taught as a youngster the God outside of time view, uh, yeah. but it never really stuck. Like, I never thought I had to believe that. Mm-hmm. And so when I was introduced to the idea that God is experiencing time sequentially like we do, that I didn't have a hard time accepting it. I, I realized it was not the common view, but man, yeah. it fits the Bible so much better than the, than the God outside time view you. I mean, you know, how many people are upset because they don't like the God of the Bible who is wrathful? Well, God is Mm -hmm. wrathful in scripture because God is responding to sin, but a response is a time-oriented thing. God is happy when people do well. That's a time-oriented thing if God's responding. 
God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face, then I will. And he gives one option. If they yeah. don't, then I will. And he gives another option. Well, that sounds mm -hmm. like God is laying out options, doesn't know for sure what's going to happen. And the and time is real for God as well. So yeah. for me, it wasn't hard to accept that position, even though it is the case that I think it was the minority amongst the people that trained me as a child. Yeah. And I think, and this could be because of my own limited imagination, but from just how, if I had to define what existence is, I, I think something necessarily has to have substance and temporal parts to exist. You know, mm -hmm. if it doesn't exist yeah. in time, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So for me, uh, it, especially now, I'm like, I, I don't think I could believe in a God that doesn't have time because if it doesn't experience time, it doesn't really exist. <laughs> like if you don't have any temporal part, you know what I mean? Yep. Then you don't, how could you interact with me in my time? Yeah. Because I'm with you don't you. have a temporal part. Yeah. That actually points to the number one reason I think God is temporal rather than non-temporal or time yeah. full rather than timeless. And that number one reason is that I think love requires real giving and receiving. And mm -hmm. that means responsiveness. It means experiencing moment by moment. Uh, if God is truly a loving God, then I think God has to be experiencing time. Now, I know that my friends who think God is outside time still want to say God is loving, but what they end up sacrificing is the idea that God's love is ever receptive or mm -hmm. responsive or uh, uh, influenced by us. They often also give up any kind of notion of God being emotionally, um, having emotions in response to creation. And it seems to me those are huge sacrifices to try to to defend a view of love that doesn't fit our experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And it's, um, so I, I, I will say the idea of God seeing my entire timeline, if I ex believed in such a thing and yeah. just loving me from birth to death all at one instance, that's a, that's a beautiful image to me. Like I actually do think that's beautiful. It just also seems a little nonsensical because there's, which is funny because I think this is where a lot of your omnipotence, your arguments against omnipotence line up with my arguments against omniscience because I'm <laughs> like, um, you mean God knew some of this was going to happen to me? He couldn't have stopped that truck from T-bowing me? What do you, what do you mean? <laughs> right. Or, you know, people yeah. who are tortured and sexually abused. I mean, yeah, it sure doesn't sound loving. Yeah, that's one where I – which is, you know, since I do believe in a form of omnipotence – I use that term very loosely because I just think most people know what I mean. I don't, after reading your stuff, I definitely don't mean all power, <laughs> but um, I, I mean something similar to it. The, what I attribute to God's ability, if he also knew exactly what was going to happen ahead of time. Yeah. That's a hard, that's a hard pill to swallow that that's a loving God knew ahead of time that someone was going to be murdered and, didn't just stop things from happening. <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm captured by your saying that you, if God did know your entire future history and God loved you anyway, that would be attractive to you. It seems to me it's just equally attractive, maybe even more so, if God doesn't know your timeline in the future, but every single moment of your life loves you in spite of your choices, sometimes your bad choices. Oh, that yeah. seems to me as equally glorious, maybe even more so, because it means that um, God sometimes gets really disappointed and pissed when we hurt each other and hurt ourselves, and yet God loves us anyway. Yeah, yeah, the I, yeah, that's it. It's funny because I, I still think the one is a beautiful image. I think it, it might be definitely a more beautiful image to say God is more or less holding all of my potential futures, looking at all of them, going. I love this guy because e even I myself in my own limited knowledge know that there's plenty of potential futures where I'm terrible because there's plenty of my past where I was terrible. <laughs> and I'm like, right. I know I can be that. I know I have the potential for that. And to think that God could love me anyway, knowing that I have that potential, that is definitely more beautiful. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. Um, <laughs> not that we're just trying to come up with whatever belief makes God look best because 
<laughs> you know, you know. Uh, actually, I, I want to speak in favor of that, Joshua. Okay, I, yeah. I know that that that's going to be a criticism by some people. Oh, Joshua and Tom, they're just making up the God they would love <laughs> to believe in. Well, part of me wants to say, yeah. So what's so bad about that? <laughs> like, I think yeah. God is even better than what I could make up. So, yeah. you know, why why think my intuitions about what is lovely, excellent, beautiful, truthful, wise, etc. Why think those are so far off the mark? If they are, God is probably even better than what we could imagine. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. There was one. I think it was a human philosopher that that basically made an argument for God, but he's not necessarily usually thought of as Christian. It might've been Kant. It might've been Immanuel Kant. I don't think it was, but it might've been. But but the argument kind of went as, if I can imagine, whatever I can imagine, I've always found something that's better than my ability to imagine it. Because, you know, like just like if I try to remember something, I don't remember it in all of its greatness. I don't remember tragedy and all of its terribleness. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was kind of the idea of, because that is true, if I can imagine an all-loving being, the, the most I can imagine it, there must be something even better than that. Um, I don't think it's really a very reasonable argument, but I think <laughs> yeah. it's a very interesting and beautiful argument. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I don't think it is a proof by any means, but yeah, no. I do think it should serve as a reminder that instead of compromising for um, – visions of God that don't portray God as particularly loving, um, why not push push the envelope and and uh, oh, yeah. be willing to rethink our views so that Ooh. God can be perfectly loving? I think if I was to put it in like proper like reasoning structure, maybe what you're trying to say goes like, if we believe in an all good God, then the most good I can imagine, since I am not all good, that God has to at least be that good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or more than that good. Yeah. 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 No, that, that actually, oh, man, that makes a lot of sense. So <laughs> I think we, we've kind of hit it on, this is why we believe omniscience. Uh, I hope uh, you know, we talked some about the other side and I hope we did it justice. You know, there are, you know, the prophetic things we mentioned in the Bible. There is this idea of, um, you know, if you're going to say God created everything ex nihilo, all powerful, one way to understand all powerful would be to say that he created all of time. That's why he has power over all of time, which is why he can save everyone for all of time. You know, I, I see those arguments. I don't think they're terrible arguments. I, I just feel like they're not true. <laughs> like, like it just doesn't match reality to me. Yeah. Um, but I want well, to ask, think, okay, go ahead. I want to, I want to actually emphasize an aspect in this debate that is rarely emphasized. Um, you know, some people hear me or you or others talk about God's relation to time and think, oh, man, that's so esoteric. That's so abstract. I mean, does it really matter at the end of the day? No one can really know. And I think it does matter mm -hmm. in at least this way and probably lots of others. The people I know who think, who choose to decide God experiences time moment by moment, and therefore doesn't know the future, time and time again, those people testify to feeling liberated, excited, to feeling like their lives yeah. matter and their choices really count. They get this kind of um, zestiness or exuberance to their lives that they didn't have previously. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a psychological advantage to thinking God experiences time and doesn't know the future because the future isn't there. Because what it's implying is that the future is going to be partly decided by the choices that you and I make, and therefore mm -hmm. our lives matter. Yeah. Man, I like that, especially because that sort of goes into what my, my next questions were, kind of oh, on this good. practical side of things. Yeah, I am. Because okay. I'm curious about what our beliefs and other people's beliefs really entail. Um, and I, I want to stop here, though, because we've used different language around this, and, and I kind of want to see what I would say if it lines up exactly with how you would say Because I okay. personally, I don't like saying God can't know the future. Rather, I think I would prefer to say God knows every future. Does that line would, up okay? or is that... I would not say it like that, because okay. I say saying that God knows every future sounds like the future is knowable. 
Okay, so every potential future? Yeah, I would say God knows all the potentials. Yeah. Oh, yeah, potentials. That's a better word. Yeah. Also, potential is just more positive feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. So with that, so how – what is the functional difference between omniscience and omnipotence? Because we, we've kind of touched on that a little bit, and I think that's one practical thing that it is hard to get around because – for for me to say that I kind of believe in omnipotence and I definitely don't think – like I definitely believe in omniscience, but I don't think God knows all futures because – all yeah, the future because, yeah, you know, the future doesn't yeah. exist. Um, for some people, it, it seems paradoxical because if you're going to say God's all-powerful, he has to have created time. And if you're going to say that God knows everything, then you have to think that he's all-powerful because if he knows everything, he could clearly do something about everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is well, there a functional difference rather than just kind of the abstract stuff we've been getting at? There are some functional differences, but let me, before I get to that, say, um, um, remind us of a con the conversation we had about omnipotence a while ago. So you just now said something like, well, the people who say that, you know, um, God knows time, or God knows the future, um, you know, and you and I say God doesn't or can't or whatever. They look at our view and say, oh, man, they're really limiting God or God doesn't know something that's to be known or mm -hmm. something like that. And I want to remind us of the discussion we had about omnipotence in which I said that just about every major Christian theologian in history mm -hmm. has said that God can't make one plus one equal 367. Yeah. So that was a logical possibility. And what you and I are saying is that knowing the future is an ontological impossibility. And mm -hmm. so it's on par with saying God can't make one plus one equal 387. It's just not doable by anybody. Similarly, God can't know the future because there's no future to be known by anybody. It's not a limitation. <laughs> God. It's just yeah. inherently impossible to do. Yeah, so, I definitely like that distinction. Um, in terms of functionality, I, I'm interpreting your question as like, what difference does it make in like our lives? Is that what you mean by that? Um, well, that was that was going to be next. But okay. is there a difference in if, if we're just thinking of God as God? Yeah. Is there a difference in function of him being all powerful and all knowing? Or is his function the same? If he's all knowing, does that basically function as being all powerful? And if he's all powerful, does that function as being all knowing? Well, no, because you and I both think God is all-knowing. At least I do. I think yeah. you would do as well. Yeah, yeah. But we differ on omnipotence. So obviously I want to say no. <laughs> God yeah. can be yeah. all-knowing but not omnipotent. Um, if God was omnipotent in the strong sense of mm -hmm. actually controlling every last thing, then yes, omniscience and omnipotence would be identical. But you yes. want to say omnipotence isn't in that strong sense because you believe in free will. Yeah. So, like light omnipotent. I need a different word than omni. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I, I invented <laughs> omnipotence. Yeah, 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 there we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But anyway, so functionally, yeah, it does make a difference because how one thinks about God's power is going to influence how one thinks about God's knowledge and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that the reason that question – interests me is because knowledge is power to, to me. So to know everything in a lot of ways is to have power over those things. But I think that is, it just, it see, it feels different. J just, you know, like I know that this can is aluminum that doesn't give me the power to change it to some other substance. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I think when we say knowledge is power, we don't mean it's a one-to-one -one exact ratio. Right. I um, don't think that's what that yeah. phrase means. I think knowledge is power is a way of saying if we know more things, we know more possibilities and ways to act. I don't think it means that, um, you know, to know it is to control it. Yeah. Yeah. And to where it would be interesting if Christian Ashley was here, I'm just going to keep dogging on him because he does have more of that hard omnipotence. In it. And I think yeah. if you have that view – of God is all powerful in that way that has to include power over time, which then would have to mean he's omniscient, which means you don't even need to say omniscient. You could just say omnipotent. That's, that's in that, true. Yeah. In fact, uh, in the classic tradition, Augustine and others propose that God's simplicity, divine simplicity, mm -hmm. means that all the attributes are actually all one. And uh, you shouldn't say God has various attributes. You should just say God is simple 
and therefore God's what we call God's omnipresence is God's omniscience, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a nonsensical view. I think we should reject it for reason grounds. I think we should reject it, reject it for biblical grounds. There's all kinds of problems with divine simplicity. And, and I think I have the majority of contemporary Christian philosophers on my side on this. But you're exactly yeah. right in the inference there. Yeah. As, as much as I hate to disagree with people smarter than me, I think I'm with you. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just, uh, the simple, the divine simplicity it, it feels like you're making God more simple than I am. And it just doesn't yeah. it logically just doesn't flow for me. And I, maybe I'm missing something, but yeah, I, well, you and yeah. I are in the majority on this issue, at least among yeah. contemporary yeah. Uh, Christian intellectuals, which is, you know, that that's nice. That's always nice. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to omniscience, then just specifically, if we're going to say that God knows everything, um, and you brought up before how saying God's all powerful, but then why does he allow certain things to happen? If God's all knowing, how does that impact our view of, you know, God allowing stuff like genocide, what's going on in Israel right now and, you know, Hamas, all that stuff, Gaza, um, you know, murder, rape, all these other things. If God's all knowing, does that impact how we view God's relationship to evil? Yeah, there's a big debate on this. You know, um, if you're like our friend who thinks that God is omnipotent in the strong sense, therefore God knows it all, then you've got all the problems that come from that. However, if you're a person who thinks that God is omnipotent, but God doesn't know the future, it, you might say, well, God's not sure exactly whether or not, I don't know, let's use Putin, not sure 100% whether or not Putin is in the next moment going to say, let's go bomb Kiev or Kiev. Uh, so God is not on the hook in the way that a God who's outside of time who sees all of history is on the hook. So mm -hmm. I think you've, you're, you're easier there. Um, I think the question on omniscience that we should ask is not so much whether or not God, God's knowledge of the, of the future makes God culpable for evil. I think here the question is, um, can we make real sense of creaturely freedom if mm -hmm. God knows the future? And if we yeah. can't, then we have to give up thinking creatures are free. And that goes against everything we all live as if it's true. Hey guys, and unfortunately, that is where Dr. Ord got cut off. Um, we proceed to talk a little bit more about some of this practical effects of omniscience, how it actually affects psychologically, you know, with whether, you know, we, we believe that our stance is more beneficial to people psychologically, you know, other people who see how terrible the world is and believe that God is in control and sees all time necessarily have to blame someone other than God and often blame themselves. And it can be psychologically harming, although that doesn't prove as evidence against their view or anything like that is just something that we did notice that we mentioned. Um, and we even got into some of the problems that more conservative Christian people who want to be against abortion have, where if you believe God knows all of time can control everything and has power and is against abortion, you know, they, they have this argument of, Oh, well he formed you in the womb. He knew all of the future for this child. It's like, well, if he did, then Clearly, he didn't like that future because he let it be stopped, right? So it, it's really problematic when you get into these, does God know the future? Does God have control? Is God for abortion, against abortion, all that kind of stuff? And, and we really get into some of the weeds on all that. I really hate that you guys missed that conversation, but I'm sure we'll continue it more in the future. Dr. Ord will be back in March to continue, to finish off a series we're going to be doing in February, March of controversial unity. We're going to talk about some hot button topics and he's actually going to join us to talk about the um, continuation of spiritual gifts or the ceasing of the spiritual gifts speaking in tongue the charismatic movement all of that so we're really excited to have dr ward back and to con continue these kinds of conversations and we hope you enjoyed it um i apologize you did miss the god moment and the practical thing at the end of the episode that we always do but i want to go ahead and let you know what episodes are coming up next um Next week, we'll actually be doing a crossover episode with Systematic Geekology, another podcast TJ and I are affiliated with, where we're going to be discussing five different short stories, 
and um, we're, we're going to re review it from a Christian lens. We have Pastor Will, Lutheran, we have, you know, Christian, and I mean, TJ and myself who are Pentecostal-ish, and then we have Christian who is more of a Baptist background. Um, and we're, we're going to really be looking at these stories from our different backgrounds, observing it through a Christian lens, and we're using this to promote a book fair that we hope to do next year with the Anazal Ministries Podcast Network. So we look forward to having that conversation for you all to hear that, check it out, and maybe listen to more Systematic Ecology episodes, you know, maybe. Um, also, after that episode, we're going to be having another roundtable discussion on church polity. So we're excited to talk about the different politics of the church, how we decide what we prioritize and what we will or will not do in the church and, you know, correction, all that kind of stuff. After that, we'll have Eric Nevins back to do kind of an end of the year. What is the state of Christian podcasting in America right now? So we'll be talking with him, the founder of the Christian Podcast Association. And of course, at the end of season one, we will be having Francis Chan. He is just unaware of that. So if you can let him know, let him know. We'd appreciate it. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening and for understanding um, that we, we got cut off on this. But uh, I hope you found this conversation valuable and that you'll tune back in next week. Thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. Again, you could always sponsor our show at patreon.com forward slash the Whole Church Podcast or on captivate.fm or on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a one-time tip through Captivate. Thank you for listening.